Welcome back to Big Film. This show, I've been obsessing about this show that we're about to do since, I don't know, nine, ten months ago when uh, Tom Mount and I were, uh, were uh, talking over coffee at the coffee bean in beautiful downtown. I guess that's Palm Desert. Palm Desert, right. And you said, I said something about Hitchcock, and you said, oh, yeah, I worked with Hitchcock. I was around Hitchcock on a regular basis, and that's all I can think about that you were around Alfred Hitchcock at that point in his life. It's nearing the end, not the very end, but it's, it's later in his life. Tell me, uh, we're going to do all, it's all about Hitchcock, this, this, uh, uh, this show. Uh, but let's start with how is it that you became involved with Alfred Hitchcock? This starts with Universal. Uh, I go to work for Universal in early, or very late 72, early 73. I'd been there three months maybe three and a half, four months. I was had an office in the basement of the commissary, no windows, a Remington typewriter. Glamorous. Glamorous, and a dial telephone. I was lucky to have the phone. Yeah. And Mr. Wasserman stopped me in a hallway. Lou Wasserman was the chairman of the company. Lou Wasserman had a long history with Alfred Hitchcock. He had been his agent since he came to America to make Rebecca for... David Selznick, right, somewhere in the late 30s, I'm guessing. Which he didn't consider a Hitchcock film, if I remember correctly. You are remembering perfectly. Yeah, he yeah it's, a, it's a beautiful film, but he says that's Selznick's film. Right. That's not my film. Yes, he was he was not happy about his experience with David Selznick, like many, many other directors, right. I will say. There were, right. after all, three directors on Gone with the Wind. Right. So, Mr. Wasserman said, uh, I want you to go have lunch with Mr. Hitchcock once a week. From now on, your job, if Mr. Hitchcock is unhappy about anything, if he is, if his feathers are ruffled at all, you come running back to me personally and tell me he is the most important person on this lot. Why is, well, I mean, I, I understand he's an important director, and why was he such an important person on the lot? Mr. Hitchcock and, and Mr. Wasserman were close friends. Uh -huh. Their wives were close friends. They had dinner every Thursday night at Mr. Wasserman's house for years. He had represented Hitch since he came to the U.S. to do the famous Rebecca, the so-called Selznick film. Yes. And they had been through unbelievable stuff together. Let me give you a good example. Okay. Wasserman was the most powerful agent in Hollywood. His company, Music Corporation of America, MCA, moved to Hollywood from Chicago in 1947. Jules Stein, who had founded MCA, anointed Wasserman president of the company in 1947 when they moved to L.A. Wasserman was unbelievably smart, unbelievably tough, and single-minded. He required that all of the people he represented gave him full power of, of authority over their lives, financial power, business power. What does that mean exactly? We it mean full power of, of authority over their lives. It means that when he wanted Mr. Hitchcock to do a picture at MGM, mm -hmm. he simply said to MGM, yes, Hitch will show up and do this picture. They had a film, the director had fallen out, the script was in shambles, they had an actor, Mr. Hitchcock had no idea that the film was even being made, Mr. Wasserman made a deal for him, but it wasn't just a deal, it was a very, very aggressive deal. Lou was always focused on trying to get for his clients uh, as close to a pure gross definition as possible. That was unheard of in Hollywood right. in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. There were only a tiny handful of people who got gross. Who participated in the profits of, of a movie. From dollar one. Right. It's a big deal. Yeah. Studios had never let that happen. Right. The first time it ever happened for an actor was on Winchester 73. Ah, the Jim, that's a Jimmy famous, Stewart. famous Jimmy Stewart. And he got, got real money off that. Represented Jimmy Stewart, yeah. and he got him 2% of the gross of the picture. And it was a big hit. And it was a big hit. Yeah. And Jimmy Stewart was already well off, and then he was wealthy. Yes. So on this particular picture, Lou called up Mr. Hitchcock and said, you know, this is good news. I've got a great picture for you. It's going to start in about a month. You have to report to MGM. The budget's decent. You've got this power and this power, et cetera, and I've got you an unbelievably good deal. I got you a fee that's bigger than any fee you've ever had, and I also have you a piece of the gross. And Mr. Hitchcock said, I can't do it, Lou. 
I'm sailing in two weeks to Europe with Alma, his wife, and mm-hmm. longtime collaborator. Editor. Edited editor, it as his ed- pictures. Well, among other things, she's yeah. also a co-screenwriter on right. many films, right. especially the English films. And Alma was a terrific person, and they were very much in love. And and they he had promised her this vacation in Europe, and they had booked on a steamship out of New York, and they were going to fly to New York and then take the boat across the pond, and he just wasn't going to do it. Right. So Mr. Wasserman said, let me make this very clear to you. Not only do I have the authority to commit you to this picture, if you turn down this picture, you will no longer be my client. That was a big deal. Yes. He wasn't just a client. They were friends, cohorts. Mr. Wasserman had set up and ended setting up everything in, in Mr. Hitchcock's life, including the television show. Which, which was also a huge hit, which I still watch. It's a fantastic show. It is a great show and made Mr. Hitchcock fabulously wealthy, et cetera. So finally, grudgingly, Mr. Hitchcock said yes. By the way, I've been told this story by both Mr. Hitchcock and Mr. Wasserman. So I see both sides right. of it slightly. Right. The uh, script was miserable. Hitchcock had about 10 days to rewrite it. He did that with Alma. And another writer, I think they used Ernie Lehman to come in, uncredited, I think, mm-hmm. to punch up the script and try to make it work. And it was a mess. And shooting it, they had a lot of location shots that Mr. Hitchcock moved into sound stages and less stuff. Cary Grant was in the movie, and, and Mr. Hitchcock was dubious about Cary Grant. Remember that Mr. Hitchcock, when asked about how he directed actors, said, I find no need to explain anything to an actor in advance. I simply tell them what to do. <laughs> well, he was the one who the, the famously called them cattle, I think, at one point. Didn't he call yes, actors I cattle? Yes, I think that's right. Cattle was, uh, was nice, and yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I think I, that's right. that reminds me that Carrie Fisher always referred to herself as an actress as trick-talking meat. Mm, so that yeah. was a little right. more uh, less kind yeah. in any event. The picture got made. The minute the picture was over, Hitchcock and Alma left for Europe. He never stayed to edit the film. Mm -hmm. The film was edited at MGM in their editorial department, and the picture came out while they're in Europe on this lengthy vacation. They're in Paris, and the film was released, and it's a giant hit. It's not a small hit. It's the largest hit at that time in Hitchcock's career. It's North by Northwest. Wow. And (laughs) so... (laughs) <laughs> Not only is it a giant hit, but because of the deal, within two or three weeks of the release, an enormous amount of money starts flowing into Mr. Hitchcock's bank. Right. You know, the picture is a hit. Yes. It's quickly in profits. He's participating and in those profits. And he's in those profits. Yes. At a, I mean, so he decides that he has to do something for Mr. Wasserman, given the bountiful return on the picture and the trouble they had with each other around doing it. So he decides the thing to do is to find the ugliest, most expensive painting possible and (laughs) gift it to Mr. Wasserman. (laughs) And the reason he did that is that they had dinner together every Thursday night. So he couldn't just put it in the garage somewhere. Couldn't give it away to a museum. Had to hang it in the house. Right. So he found a Vlaminck, Russian fauve painter, famous for his purples and acid yellows. Uh Uh-huh. Really not very attractive painting. Cost in those days almost slightly less than $100,000. Ah. A major piece of artwork. Right. Shipped it to Lou as his gift. (laughs) On Lou's end, he said, I knew Hitch had me Mm -hmm. when I opened the damn painting. I knew it had to go up somewhere. So rather than hide from it, I forced Edie, that's Mr. Wasserman's wife, right. I forced Edie to hang it in the entry hall. Oh. And when I went to see Mr. Wasserman at his home, that painting was still hanging in the entry hall. And I should say, saga of that painting is that the week after Mr. Hitchcock died, mm-hmm. Edie Wasserman gave that painting to the County Museum. (laughs) No need for it anymore. No need for it anymore. So, 
they had an amazing relationship. So my job now was to make sure that Mr. Hitchcock was not unhappy. Okay. He was making a film, Family Plot. Ah, yes. Bruce Dern, uh, Karen Black. That's right. uh, William Devane. Bill Devane, that's right. Yes. I know the movie. It's not a great film. Barbara Harris. Barbara Harris, yes. Who can act. She's in that movie. I actually asked, uh, had Bruce Dern on The View once and asked him, I said, did Hitchcock ever say what I think he said, which is you'll be the first person I made a star? And he says, I don't remember any of that. Uh, he told me other Hitchcock stories. But what, what's interesting is Hitchcock, and I'm, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to be all over this. I'm going to always stop you because I have a thousand things to say. Please. Hitchcock always considered himself not a star maker. Correct. He, wa- he was like, you know, just get me a matinee idol, Jimmy Stewart, uh, Cary Grant, they'll do, you know. And so when you have movies that like um, a Saboteur, which is my very favorite yes. Hitchcock film, my Good very film. favorite Hitchcock film, uh, and I've seen it like, you know, 30 times. Right. And people say, Saboteur doesn't even have, it has a, you know, Robert Cummings and Priscilla Lane. It's like, who, ca- who cares about Saboteur? I said, that's what's so great about it. Because he wanted Cary Grant, and I think it was Barbara uh, Stanwyck or somebody like that, somebody, and right. he couldn't get them. And right. he was very unhappy with the film. And I think the film is absolutely brilliant because of these sort of B players in it. I love it. Anyway, carry on with your story. And so I go to have lunch with Mr. Hitchcock once a week, every Wednesday for the next two and a half years. During that time, Family Plot is finished, comes out, it's not a hit right. by Hitchcock standards. It did pretty well, by the way. But, it did, okay. Oh, n- Hitchcock didn't make a movie that lost money. Yeah. I should just say about that, Hitchcock films were incredibly durable. Yeah. Do you know, Bill, that 39 Steps, one of his best British films, right. before he moved to the US. The greatest movie. Fantastic. It's a, it's a fantastic Funny movie. film, actually. And, well, he had a very macabre sense of humor, yeah. as you know. And yeah. it always showed up in the films. 39 Steps was released in 1935. Right. In 1938, in that year alone, in the city of Manhattan, that film was revived in 31 theaters years after it was released. 31 separate revivals. It's such a perfect plot that... Uh, you know, I don't know where it was 10, 15 years ago, they, they, they did a Broadway version of the film. It's not just, a, it's not just the plot. It's the film attempting to recreate every, the, the theater experience attempting to recreate every scene in the film. Hysterically, right. by right. the way, it's one of the greatest things you ever get a chance. I don't know where it's running now. It's probably nowhere, but it was fantastic. Carry on. So uh, Mr. Hitchcock uh, asked Johnny Williams to score a family plot. Johnny Williams had just done Jaws, I believe. What year was the first Jaws? Jaws was, um, um, I think that's right. Yeah, it's right there. Nin- yeah, right. 1976. So a year. 76. So. Yeah, so maybe the same year Family Plot is being finished. Okay. I think it was 76 or yeah. 77, something yeah, like sure. that. And so he hires Johnny Williams. And then Johnny Williams has a unique experience. He's never had a director who showed up for the score every day, all day, <laughs> and sat next to him and said to Johnny Williams, and Johnny Williams, by the way, is a lovely man and a wonderful composer, but he said, the most fun I ever had scoring a movie was with Mr. Hitchcock. He uh. said, this was an amazing experience because Mr. Hitchcock was as smart about the music in the film as I was, maybe smarter. Wow. And that's Johnny Williams' take. Hitch s- sat there in the scoring stage at Universal Full Orchestra Mm -hmm. and said, a little less timber there. Mm -hmm. Give me it. See if we can bring the bass up. What are we doing with the cello in this piece? Really? I mean, he was unbelievably smart and detailed. I should say, Mr. Hitchcock was smart about everything. So I'm having lunch. You you know, uh, you have to uh, slow this down a second. You're having lunch, what, at the commissary every day? Oh, no, please. Where do you go? So we go to Mr. Hitchcock's office, which was actually not an office. It was a suite of connected bungalows on the lot. All right. And they'd all been built in the 50s for the old Universal, and they'd been upgraded in kind of period 18th century English antiques. This is what I think. I think of him as someone of great taste. Great taste. Okay, so you go to his office... 
So I go to his office, and there's a dining room, a separate dining room okay. off his office. So in the dining room, a waitress from the commissary brings lunch. She brings Mr. Hitchcock the same thing every day. What? Every, what is every it? Every lunch, not every day. I don't know. It's a rare steak, cottage cheese, and mm, let's say a beverage. A b- <laughs> He's having. He has a cocktail at, yes, at lunch he has of a cocktail some sort, lunch, which, uh, a martini which, or something, or uh, something a little more sophisticated than a martini, a little more English than that. Okay. But in any event, All right. it mysteriously appears from our commissary, which doesn't have a liquor license right. by any means. Yes. You know, but it's there. Right. And so he has that for lunch. And then I barely say anything. In the beginning, I'm so goddamn intimidated sure. by being around Alfred Hitchcock. And remember, yeah. as a film student in Los Angeles, Ugh. I had attended a 24-hour I cannot retrospective imagine. of every single Hitchcock film in order. Really? And, I'd seen, and Sean Daniel and I and a couple of other maniacs. That made you sit through Topaz? Oh, yeah, we've sat through everything. <laughs> we sat through everything. And one of us would take turns running across the street and get hamburgers and bring them back in the yeah. theater. This was all at the um, Chinese on Hollywood Boulevard. Oh. 24-hour Hitchcock marathon. Wow. I was there for every bit of it. That was fantastic. In any event, the great man starts to tell me things. He starts to tell me stories. He says, what's a MacGuffin? I yeah. go, well, it's sort of a, a device, right? And I, he said, no. Let me explain what a MacGuffin is. Said, a man gets on a train headed for Scotland. Yes. Said, the man sits down. After putting his straw hamper in the rack above his head, he sits down, opens a newspaper, and begins to read. Another man enters the compartment, sits down opposite him. The train continues on and on. They, neither of them speak to each other. Finally, the newcomer in the compartment can't stand it. He says, excuse me, are you going to Scotland? He said, yes, I am. I said, well, and you're carrying only, you have no luggage, you carry only that hamper. He said, yes, well, that's really all I need. And he said, well, all you need, what, what are, if, if you don't mind my asking, what are you going to do in Scotland? He said, well, I'm uh, going grouse hunting in Scotland. The other man says, well, you know, at this time of year, there are no grouse in Scotland. So what do you have in that thing? He said, oh, well, let's just call it a MacGuffin. That's the story. That's That's the the story of MacGuffin. MacGuffin. In other words, the MacGuffin is that thing which is utterly unnecessary at the end of the plot, but that thing which excites and rivets all interest before it's unnecessary. You, you get the sense that, that he ha- had obviously had this m- amazing sort of classic period of, of films where he did, you know, I don't know, Shadow of a Doubt and uh, Strangers on a Train and, and all these great, great movies that people, Rope and all, right. this, all this stuff that he does. And then he transitions into this sort of like gigantic, you know, films like The Man Who Knew Too Much and, and uh, uh, North Lane Northwest, as you mentioned, Vertigo, all these things. What I think is fascinating to this, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of off on my own Sorry. world, so forgive me, so but I can't, no, when I'm, we're talking about Hitchcock, I have a thousand fine. things that come to my mind, is that it's been interesting to me to watch the film Vertigo, because when I uh, was uh, in film school, everybody said, well, the Citizen Kane is the greatest movie ever made, and there's nothing else, and uh, that was, when I was in film school, it was right after The Godfather came out, and it took sort of a decade or two for people to say The Godfather is the greatest film ever made. Right. Now, Vertigo is the right. greatest film ever made. If you notice this, it's funny that we skipped over Vertigo and then we've gone back to it. Yes, we have gone back to it. it. In fact, I read recently in yeah. a Rolling Stone analytic of the two best films ever made, Citizen Kane and Vertigo. Yeah, so which, which probably makes sense why Orson Welles couldn't stand yes. um, Alfred Hitchcock. Couldn't stand Because he, he got to direct what he wanted to direct all those years when Orson got to do two or three pictures and then fell right. on hard times and yeah, he did Touch of Evil, but after that, what? You know, and whereas Hitchcock kept making hit after hit after hit. He made hit had after hit. Had a big TV show, had yes. a lot of money. 
Never had to do a game show. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Never you know, had to be on Hollywood Squares. Never had to be on Hollywood Squares and all That's that stuff. That's right. No. Uh, it, it, it's fascinating, that rivalry, that jealousy there with, oh, uh, yeah. with Orson Welles. Yeah. There's no doubt. And, and Mr. Hitchcock said about Orson Welles, he was, quote, an estimable filmmaker. That's the most he could give up, huh? <laughs> okay. Here, here's what I think, and I'm, I know that... I know that there's a story about Psycho in the sense of that, how big that movie was um, in, 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 the, in, the, in the scheme of things in his career. Could you, can you tell us about that? Well, it's really simple. Um, Mr. Hitchcock was doing the television show. Remember that Mr. Wasserman was producing the television show. Right. That was Review TV, which was owned by MCA as an agency which had what is the old CBS studios in Studio City, what became Review Television for a decade or two right, okay. before Wasserman and Stein bought Universal. So they were cranking the TV show out from, I think, 55 to... They probably had seven years or something. Oh, no, they had a 10 or 12 years. Did they really? Yeah, that 10 long? Or 12 years I had no idea. TV show. That's really, it was event. a huge hit. It was a huge hit. And so... Mr. Hitchcock wanted to make Psycho. The problem is the underlying material on which Psycho was based was owned by Paramount. Mm. So he had to make the film for Paramount. Mr. Wasserman was not thrilled about that because he already had his eyes set on buying Universal. So he couldn't let his number one director just make a film for Paramount that Paramount would own. And Hitchcock was Mr. Hitchcock. He was already a star director. So sure. Lou made a deal with Paramount as follows. They paid Mr. Hitchcock a certain amount of money to direct the film. They gave him profit participation in the film. At the end of eight years after the initial release, the film moved to the ownership of Mr. Hitchcock. Oh. Mr. Hitchcock signed at that time a distribution deal with Universal. So the film moved from Paramount to Universal, and they shot it on the Universal lot. Yes, they that's right, famously, the, yes. They built the Psycho House, yeah, yeah, which right. is still standing, sure. on the Universal lot, and they wanted to make it, Mr. Hitchcock was always parsimonious. Mm -hmm. He did not hire expensive people. He wouldn't do it. He wouldn't pay Cary Grant his fee. He right. wouldn't pay Jimmy Stewart his fee. Right. He wouldn't do anything like that because... If they wanted to work on this movie, great. If not, there was always someone else. Sure. And so that film came out. It didn't just come out. It became, by a light year, the largest film in Hitchcock's, most successful film in Hitchcock's. Is that it? Is, is Psycho the, the biggest box office uh, Hitchcock film? Hitchcock film. I, didn't, I don't think I realized that. By far. By I probably would have thought North by Northwest. No, no, no. I knew Vertigo was not a huge hit. Vertigo was a soft, it made money. Vertigo it made money, was, but it but wasn't a big hit. It wasn't hit. a giant hit, yeah. no. Mr. Hitchcock did a very clever thing. He and Mr. Wasserman, as you will learn from this episode we're doing, had a complex relationship. Mm -hmm. So he had a bunch of money he'd made, many tens of millions of dollars on Psycho. A lot of money back in the day. Sure. You earned 20 million bucks. Was it 1960 or something? Yeah, 20 like that? million bucks in 1960, a lot of money. So he went to Mr. Wasserman, who, remember, was right in the early moment. It was the first year of owning Universal. First year. They bought yeah. Universal in 5960. Yeah. And I'll tell you about buying Universal in a little bit because that's funny in it of itself. But Mr. Hitchcock goes to Mr. Wasserman and says, Lou, I have all this money. I don't know what to do with it. I think the wisest thing I can do is buy stock in your new studio. Mm. So Mr. Hitchcock, in 1960, on the back of Psycho, became the third largest shareholder in Universal, which I, he remained until his death. I had no idea. So he was, he was really basically like a co-owner at Universal. Yeah, he was a co-owner. Nobody oh, wow. knew that, by the way. That was wow. not public knowledge. But it is today, of course, postpartum with Hitchcock. People know that. But in the day, nobody knew Mr. Hitchcock was a major shareholder. He wasn't on the board. He didn't uh, opine about the ownership or activity of the company. And Mr. Wasserman 
never mentioned it. Hmm. I worked for Mr. Wasserman for 13 years. I never heard of it. Uh, I assume Hitch, I'll call him Hitch because we're close now. Hitch yes. didn't bring this up to you at any point no. when you're having lunch. He doesn't never, say, hey, you never know. Never mentioned it. Wow. Never mentioned it. You know, you know it's funny. When I think about these, these Hitchcock films, uh, like I think of this weird uh, kind of period because Psycho's right after North by Northwest. They couldn't be more different films. Right. I mean, Psycho really, I'm probably on paper, it didn't look very good. You know, it, it had... It had uh, the the only big star in it dies in the first act. Yeah, <laughs> you that's know, right. It's it's a uh, it's really bleak. I mean, and it's just, there's not a laugh in it. You know, I mean, it's, it's just a bleak movie. But two other things. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but Edie Wasserman, Lou's wife, mm -hmm. had to talk Janet Lee into doing the picture ah. because it was done so cheaply. They were paying people nada, and it was done almost entirely with Mr. Hitchcock's Hitchcock presents television crew. Right. It was a television movie made on a feature lot as if it were a feature. It, it's funny because now that thing, that whole idea was like, get a big star and kill him off. It's now, now everybody's doing it. Right. That, that was the first time you saw something like, like Nobody, I just saw this, this picture with Sandra, Sandra Bullock where they kill off Brad Pitt in like, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes or something. Right. Right. Um, it, it's a, I'm sorry if I ruined that for anybody. <laughs> uh, but, but why, here's what I find interesting about his career and I'll let you get back to this, but I have to say this. He does all these, these, these two kind of novel films, uh, uh, Psycho and the Birds. They, they, they basically follow one another right. uh, in, in relatively short order over two or three years. And then he goes into what I find this, this triad of bad movies. Right. I, they're bad to me. I, I, they ha I mean, there are moments in Torn Curtain that are interesting. The, the, the oven scene is an interesting Hitchcock type scene. Right. Marnie has a couple of moments. Topaz has no moments. Right. He has these, this, this sort of three strikes kind of movie thing. So, so you're getting him sort of after that. Yes. But you're also getting him if I, if I, if I have the timeline correct, because he does these three movies and it's almost like he says to himself, you know, I got to go back to England. I yes. got to go do, I got to go do the lady vanishes and the third th So he does frenzy, which literally could have been one of those movies that he did in England. Don't correct. you think he does frenzy? And by the way, frenzy, which turns is great. Out, turns out it's not only a great movie. It makes a lot of money. It makes it's a, a lot of money. Hit for Mr. That's Pritchard. right. He's back. Yeah, he's back. And, and, uh, shooting it in the UK is a dream for him. Yes. He and Alma move to the UK. They bring Patricia, their daughter, with them. She's by now probably 19 or 20 or something. Right. And uh, it's a wonderful experience. So in any event, yes. Mr. Hitchcock and Mr. Wasserman were joined at the hip. Right. They did a lot of things together. So at my job was really important. That is to say, one day, we were having lunch, Mr. Hitchcock and I, and he said, you know Annie in the commissary? I said, yes, Annie was a very old waitress who'd been in the commissary for 100 years. Annie brought the food to Mr. Hitchcock's lunch every day. He said, I understand that they're going to let Annie go. I said, oh, I hadn't heard that. Mm -hmm. He said, yes. Could you see what you can do about that? <laughs> So I went running to Mr. Wasserman. Right. Secretary shooed me in and said, don't take more than three minutes, you know. Go into Mr. Wasserman's office, which, by the way, had a giant 18th century English desk in it without a single paper on the desktop ever. Mm. Mr. Wasserman's That would have been rule, tacky, yes. It would have been tacky, but also Mr. Wasserman's rule was don't write anything down. Ah, well... I can, I can see why you would have that, yes. <laughs> that rule. <laughs> it seemed like a reasonable rule. So he would, by the way, occasionally come to my floor when I was running the studio and look at my desk to make sure there was nothing on it by the end of the day. Oh, really? And by the way, Mr. Wasserman got to the company every morning at 6 a.m. So did I. Yeah. And we did that for years. And anybody who didn't want to show up at 6 a.m. and didn't want to leave at 8 didn't need to come in the next day. So you go into his office. And I said, they're going to let Annie go, and this disturbs Mr. Hitchcock. He said, they're letting Annie go? <laughs> I said, yes. He said, well, please tell Hitch it's taken care of. Mm. 
He never heard another word about never it. Never heard another That's word. the most important thing I ever did for Mr. Hitchcock. <laughs> so I will say we started to develop a new movie. He wanted to make a film based on a book that had been published in the UK by, I think, a Finnish writer originally called The Short Night. Terrific book. Great idea for a movie. Really simple plot. A guy escapes from prison. He reunites with his wife. He's a criminal, a master criminal, a murderer. They are hiding on a small island off the Finnish coast. The policeman, the detective, is on his trail, follows him from his escape in the prison, figures out where he is, goes to this island. There's no one else on the island. Hides on the island, is discovered by the murderer's wife, and gradually falls in love with her. And so the murderer discovers that this has happened, and he takes the children they have and absconds. And our hero has to rescue the children and arrest their father on behalf of the woman he loves. Sounds great. It is great. Movie. So he yeah. hires Ernie Lehman, who had worked with him many times, to write this. Ernie Lehman does a version. It's not working. He hires another writer, does a version. It's not working. He finally turns to me and says, and by the way, he's already sent people out. He, working with Mr. Hitchcock, there was no moment when anybody gave a Hitchcock movie a go-ahead. He simply worked. Right. When he was ready to film. The money was there and he it. Was did it was he just filmed. Yeah, right. So unlike every other experience I had at Universal where I had to beg and plead people to make, you know, car wash or E.T. or something. Sure. This was devoid of that experience. Mr. Hitchcock had already sent a, a location crew to Finland to find the right island. Mm -hmm. He'd already had people working on drawings. He had Edith Head drawing costume designs for him. He had... You know, and and so he would, as he had done on many other films, he'd shoot some of it on location and a lot of it on the Universal lot. So Mr. Hitchcock's health was also failing him. He was becoming unsteady on his feet. Right. He had a cane that helped. So the camera department was trying to figure out how he could move around the stage and talk to the actors and have some flexibility. So we took a Cadillac convertible. We ripped the interior convertible out, and in that interior, we bolted a crane, a camera crane. Mm -hmm. And we, on that camera crane, we outfitted a seat and rigged it with a microphone. And this was designed so that Mr. Hitchcock could step into the seat on the crane, and they could drive the car onto the stage. Mm. He could then, with a toggle move it up, down, sideways, in any direction, and extend it out and talk to actors. And he was wired in to everybody on the stage through their walkies. So if he wanted to tell the, uh, a grip or a best boy to change the filter on a light, right. he would simply do that. And that allowed him flexibility on the stage. So we were ready to make the short night. It sounds like, by the way, Peter O'Toole and the stunt man, doesn't it? Cause <laughs> remember, the stunt, he's always uh, dropping into on a crane into a scene. And yes, kind of, yes. Anyway, that, that must have been based on that. Uh, it's, it may go, be. go ahead, Can, carry on. So Hilton Green was uh, my head of physical production at Universal at that stage. He had started out as a line producer on Mr. Hitchcock's television show. He was very close to Mr. Hitchcock. Both his older brother, Marsh Green, had also been head of physical production. These The Green brothers were wonderful, smart physical production guys, and I learned everything from these guys. All right. And Marsh had retired. Hilton had taken over. I hired a young writer named David Freeman to come in and work on the script. Mr. Hitchcock said, all these old guys, because all he knew were old guys at this stage, they're not making this work. We need fresh blood. So I hired David Freeman. Freeman interviewed with Mr. Hitchcock. He read some of Freeman's work. He said, okay. David Freeman went to work. Didn't get any better. Mm. Script never got to a point where Mr. Hitchcock or I or anybody reading it thought, this is really the movie 
we simply couldn't get it started. Even though we'd spent a lot of money, we prepped it totally. It was ready to go in almost every way. We were beginning to talk about cast. One day, Mr. Hitchcock called Hilton Green over to his office. Hilton Green went scampering to Hitchcock's office, and Mr. Hitchcock set him down and said, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. Can't direct anymore? Can't I can't make work him, anymore. Can't work anymore. I'm not I well enough. I'm not well enough to direct a picture. Right. He had tears in his eyes. Hilton, of course, was crying. I mean, this is Mr. Hitchcock was at Two Universal. Mr. Hitchcock was our connection yeah. to the heart, soul, and integrity of filmmaking. But, you know, p- people who didn't know him on the street would be crying to hear that. Of course. And then he said, will you please tell my people, my employees, because he couldn't face them. Mm. He couldn't face his lifetime secretary, Sue, right. who did everything for him. Right. He said, will you please go tell Mr. Wasserman first? So Hilton Green went to see Mr. Wasserman and told Mr. Wasserman. Hilton Green told me that that was the most horrible moment of his life. Right. Telling Mr. Wasserman that Mr. Hitchcock was no longer going to be able to make a film and wanted to stop. And Mr. Wasserman cried, which I'd never seen him do in 13 years. Right. He was not a guy who was warm and fuzzy. He did not cry. Everybody was shocked at the studio. It was as if it was a day of mourning, you know? Yeah. Mr. Hitchcock was alive. Alma was still alive. But that era was over. How much later did, uh, how long, when did he die after that? I'm trying to get the time frame. I think he died in 1980. I'm not sure. Yeah. Sure. But But we kept his offices. We didn't touch them. Yeah. We kept his full staff on. We paid them. Once in a while, for, for uh, the first year or two of his, quote, retirement, he would show up on the studio at the studio unannounced here and there and answer some letters or you know, do an interview with uh, somebody. And, you know, um, in those days, um, he had a lot of uh, uh, fans in other countries. As you know, the French considered him the great auteur of sure. the thing. and no. says here, by the way, you got it right. It died in 1980, April 29th, 1980. Okay. okay. And that was a black day yeah. at Universal okay. as well. In any event, so then I knew Alma, and I knew Patricia, who was by now an adult, married, living in the Valley. Right. And Patricia Hitchcock, Pat Hitchcock, had been in several of his movies, my favorite piece being Strangers on a Train, where she's murdered. Right. You know, and right. the killer crushes her glasses, and all we <laughs> see are the crushed <laughs> glasses and the weeds. We don't have to see the violence. Right. Um, in any event, we Alma was not in good shape either. And within a year and a half or two years after Hitchcock died, she died. So when Alma died, I negotiated with Pat to acquire on a leased basis a 20-year window to exploit the films that Mr. Hitchcock owned. He owned Vertigo. He owned Psycho. He owned Rear Window. He owned... Um, rear Window. My wife's I, favorite. Oh, that's How a great many times to sit there? I've sat really through Rear movie. Window. My gosh. I will. It's a great movie. Yes. What can you say about Rear Window? No, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with it. No. Everything is perfect in it. Yeah. It's a perfect film. It works like gangbusters. It really does. It's just great. And I'm leaving a few out. Yeah, it's a good age. And Rope. Did he own a foreign correspondent, maybe? I don't think so. uh, There are only five of them. Okay, fine. So I think, anyway, that's five, I think. So what what we did then, we gave the Hitchcock estate $20 million to license the films for 20 years. Right. I talked Jimmy Stewart into going on the road in a re-release of Rear Window the first thing we did. We put Rear Window out on what we used to call a road show, where we would book it in a certain city for a six-week limited run, Mm -hmm. and Jimmy Stewart would show up in that city and do a big opening event, and then we'd move on. And we did that in 10, 12 cities around the U.S., but the publicity we generated allowed us to re-release it broadly. That $20 million, given all of those films and licensing them, 
to television and re-releasing them theatrically, et cetera. We were in profits in three years yeah. out of the 20-year period. Amazing. And by the way, when that period ran out, Patricia renewed a contract with Universal to release them for 20 years. And I believe in her will, she gave Universal the right to release them and refund the money to the Hitchcock estate in perpetuity. Huh. So in any event... I have to ask you this because, um, well, I've read a few books, and I read a book uh, called The Dark Side of Genius. Um, oh, I'm sorry. One thing. Yes. Trouble with Harry. That's Trouble with one. Harry, yes, that's with, the with, uh, with uh, Shirley MacLaine. That's the one I left out. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, that's a fun movie. Okay. I'm sorry. I read The Dark Side of Genius. Did you ever read the yes, Spoto book? Mm -hmm. Okay. The Spoto book. And, um, and it, it, the picture it paints of him, and by the way, this is not the only person that does this. There have been an un, some unflattering articles about, uh, you know, his relationship, obsession with uh, Tippi Hedren, I don't know, Eva Marie Saint, uh, Vera Miles, a lot of the women that he'd worked with over the years that he was inappropriate, creepy. Uh, there's The Dark Side of Genius implies that he's... Uh, a very sad, tragic figure. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, you, you've read it. You've heard all of this stuff before. I Did have. you see any of that? Was there so that? Let me tell you what I saw from Mr. Hitchcock. I was, uh, I had been working with him for about a year, and Wasserman was sending me to London to meet with all of our international distribution guys and help realign. We had a new head of international coming on board and help get that guy up to speed and realign that aspect of the company. Right. So I told Mr. Hitchcock that I wouldn't be able to see him for a week because I'd be in London. And he said, oh, I, you have to have lunch with a friend of mine while you're in London, and I'll set it up. And I said, okay, great. I didn't think much about it. Okay. Get on the plane. Go to London. By the way, going to London for MCA, going anywhere in the world for MCA was like, uh, can I say, was like we were traveling princes. <laughs> The, in London, we would be met by a proper driver with a proper Rolls limousine <laughs> yes. to take us into the city. We would go not to hotels, but to the MCA uh, uh, residence. Uh, you had, a, was, had apartments, had like a, a little nice condo no, or no, something. We had a, a two-story, beautiful, five-bedroom converted well, like military... Like a townhome type thing? Military barracks. Really? On one of the Crescent Muses in Belgravia. Belgravia, yes. And so we're That's in very high end, that Belgravia. Yes, no, no, no. So we're in the high end part of town. Yes. But we're in a little dead end, and at the end had been a, a barracks for horse officers, and it had been converted to the MCA suites in, in thing. And it had stock, the proper butler greet you at the door yeah. and carry your luggage and the thing and everything. So I get up the next morning, by the way, innocent moron that I am, I get up the next morning and I go out to look around. And the building on the right also has been somebody's private, very elaborate, beautiful private residence. Building on the left, there's an old lady and there's a, a bunch of flower beds in boxes at her front door and she's trimming some roses. And so I said, how are you? And she said, I'm fine. I said, what are you doing trimming? It, uh, seven o'clock in the morning. Yes, right. She said, oh, I'm getting ready. You know, I'm having brunch with the girls today. I said, oh, that's lovely. And so she trims, and we talk a little bit about this and that and the weather. And she said, oh, no, there's a, if you go up to the high street and make a right, there's a little pub, and there's a, a place called the Grenadier around the corner here, and you can get a really good, you know, proper roast and this and that. And right. just neighborhood information, all good. And I go back in the stock, his stock comes up to me as I go back in the house. And he said, well, so you've had a good morning? And I said, yeah, no, it's lovely here. And I've got this nice lady next door. And she, he said, he looked at me for a long beat. And he said, well, you might want to be a little more circumspect about spending time with the queen mum. Oh, you're kidding. Not kidding. Queen mother had a place where she and her <laughs> girlfriends could play cards and hang out. <laughs> and that's the reason there was a policeman at the top of the street. It right. never occurred to me. I just thought, a secure neighborhood, you know? I, you know, it's funny. So, I, st I stayed in Belgravia once for, I don't know what we were doing, an interview with, I don't know, Fergie or somebody, you know, with the, around the wedding with Barbara Walters. And we stayed in, I can't remember the name of this, this hotel. I was sort of frantically trying to find, tell you the name of the hotel. But they said it had a butler. When you said there was a butler, I, <laughs> we stayed, and they said, you have the, and they show you to your room, and they said, your butler is here anytime you need him. And, and so I kept, like, all the way, like in the middle of the night, I wake up and go, 
that butler's still out there. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would go and I'd peek out. And there's this man in like a morning suit or something. Yes, that's right. Waiting, waiting. May I help you, Mr. Getty? He's like, no, no, no. Just, no. just checking to see if you're just, still here at three o'clock in the, in the morning. morning. That's right. <laughs> that was crazy. Uh, anyway, I, I, I so digress. Bill, so go ahead. So the next, we had offices <laughs> on Piccadilly, and uh, so I go to the MCA office. I'm working, 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 and finally, an s- assistant comes in and she says, uh, "Mr. Hitchcock's car has arrived." For you take you to lunch so i go downstairs and there's a car and driver and i get in the car and i go where are we going he said well we'll be there in just a few minutes and we start driving and we right. head north out of london and we head past piccadilly and now we're past uh south kensington going by other places going by now it's the railroad tracks going by and now i realize we're driving out of london i'm not quite sure where and then there's a huge park I've forgotten the name of the park a massive park and we're going through the park And now at the end of the park, there's a road, and then that road, a copse of trees, and that opens up, and there's a kind of Georgian-era building ahead of us in stone and elaborate details and towers on either side of a guarded entrance. And I realize we're going into Wormwood Scrubs Prison, where Mr. Hitchcock is sending me to have lunch with the warden for my education. For your education. So I go in, and I'm met by a trustee, right. and they take me to the private dining room of the warden of Wormwood Scrubs, and, and the warden is a lifelong friend of Mr. Hitchcock's, yeah. and he says, I'm told to tell you two things. First, I'm told to tell you to look around here and make the decision Never to end up in a place like this. (laughs) Okay, yes. (laughs) And I said, this is fine advice, and I'm very happy to have it. And he said, and Hitchcock wants me to buy you lunch, which we're doing. We're going down here. We'll have lunch. And I've worked with him all his life on criminal issues. And I realized that Mr. Hitchcock has this ongoing relationship with the warden of a prison in London who has constantly advised him about crime and punishment. So when, so when he had questions from scripts and things, and he, and he, and he wrote about criminals, I mean, he yeah, certainly yes, did movies about uh, crime and yes, bad behavior. Time. Yeah. What's great about this, in my view, is the underlying humor of it all. Yeah. Now, Mr. Hitchcock, I know, had problems with actors and actresses, both, male and female. Some people didn't like I mean, even he told me a story about back in the day when he was in London, he was working with Sylvia Sidney on a picture. Yeah, sure. And she had a scene in the film in which she stabs her husband to death. Mm-hmm. And when he goes to shoot the scene, oh, this is Ill, this was illuminating about Hitchcock. She, he goes to shoot the scene. Sylvia Sidney's horrified. She complains to him bitterly that he never shot her once because he shot the entire scene based on her hands. They're like, Mm -hmm. 50 shots of her hands, her hand picks up a knife. Right. Her hands ring together. Her hands shake with terror. Her hands do this, her hands do that, and finally the knife plunges into the husband, Mm -hmm. and that's the murder, and it's complete, and she does not get screen time for her face because Mr. Hitchcock knows what he's doing. Yeah, because that's how he had seen it, and that's that's, uh, that's the way it was going to be. Let me say something else about this. Mr. Hitchcock broke down every script before he shot it, as he did on everything. Most script breakdowns are they're a list of the scenes and exactly what's supposed to happen in each right. scene. It's right. not the script per se. It's the scene breakdown. A scene breakdown for an ordinary movie would be 100 items, maybe 150 items for mm-hmm. a big movie. Mm-hmm. Mr. Hitchcock's scene breakdowns were every single shot. There were four or five hundred items on the breakdown. In other words, he edited the picture before he shot it. Right. He knew exactly what he wanted, Bill. Mm. Exactly. He knew precisely what was going to be in that shot. That's why the films got made quickly. There were never 20 takes. And on budget. There were never 20 takes of anything. Sure. There were barely two, maybe three, maybe one. Yeah. And... That's why he says things, constantly said things like, if I'd wanted to converse with the actors about the script, I would have done so. Mm -hmm. Because all he wanted them to do, pick up that glass, set it over there. Mm -hmm. That's all you have to do. Just Mm -hmm. do that. But what's my motivation? 
Not interested. So, so you think that probably a little bit of this is just the process. They didn't like the way he tr- they were he treated. Was ru- he was rude. Yeah, he was rude, yes. His process was rude to yeah. actors. Yeah. You know, and by the way, for Although actors, you never heard Cary Grant, or maybe you did, I don't remember. No, you never heard Cary a, Grant or Jimmy Stewart or uh, uh, Sean Connery. Yeah. You never heard any of them complain well, about him. That's I don't because remember. they understood what he was up to. Right. You know, the thing is, if you know something about filmmaking and you actually pay attention to it, if you're not yeah. just in the acting bubble where you're really worried about your close-up, mm-hmm. if you're not... I mean, I cannot tell you the number of times that Burt Reynolds said to me on many different movies, I don't have enough (laughs) close-ups. That's what's wrong with this picture. Not enough close-ups of Burt. Not enough close-ups of Burt. I mean, you go, you want to shoot yourself. And so with Mr. Hitchcock, there was never any question. You did what he asked you to do. If he said, open that door and stop, that's what you did because that's what he needed to use. And by the way, he created shots that many, many times our camera department had no idea how to make. Right. And so the boys would be working in the middle of the night regrinding a lens so that it would be wide enough to encompass all the information Mr. Hitchcock wanted in a scene or creating a special dolly that ran from the ceiling, not from the floor, that could come down a stairway and through a, another room and into another room where a man is having breakfast and end up on a close-up of his eye. Right. And I saw him describe once the, the process. It, it, it was using the birds, which I think had yes. recently come out. And, and there's, uh, there are obviously these amazing bits of editing with all the birds, you know, the, you know gathering and, and then eventually swooping down and attacking people. And he says, everybody calls this cinematography. I just call it photography. A lot of my shots are just, they're so fast that that's just, it's just a photograph almost. Yes. So I'm putting together yes. a bunch of photographs of things. So I'm, I'm happy just calling it photography. Let me say uh, two things about Mr. Hitchcock, and I'll shut up about this. But this is fun. It's been I fantastic. It's great. I really love talking about this. Yeah. He won the Irving Thalberg Award. Right. Which is given, in a weird way, better than an Academy Award inside the industry. Sure. That's an award that's only given for your body of work. Right. You know, you yeah. would give that award to people whose body of work was extraordinary over time. You don't get that when you're 12. You no. You don't get that if your pictures are too commercial. That's right. You get that if your pictures have changed the business. Sure. And that's what they did. So if you go online, and I urge people to do this, and you look up Mr. Hitchcock receiving the Irving Thalberg Award. He takes the award, he looks at it, he says, this is very heavy, and he turns to the microphone and he says, thank you, and he walks off. <laughs> That's such enough. In an era yeah, I showed of, up. <laughs> in an era of overweening nonsense and endless blather about receiving awards, Mr. Hitchcock remains, to the very end, classy and... Uh, very, very, very droll. Well, I could do uh, something on Hitchcock like every day. I know there are many more things on, on him. I'm sure in the future, maybe Mr. Spoto, who I believe is still alive, would, would love to weigh on, in on this someday. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, this has been, this is my favorite show. This was it. <laughs> this is my favorite of all the things that we've done now. I haven't done that many, but this is now number one on my list. I really appreciate you telling me everything. So, about Bill, Alfred Hitchcock. what we really ought to do for us, pardon, mm-hmm. pardon the audience having to listen to this, but for yeah. the two of us, since we're here in Rancho Mirage, mm-hmm. there is down the street a very good movie theater, multiplex, mm-hmm. new one, mm-hmm. at the group called The River down there. Right. We should talk them into doing a 24-hour Hitchcock marathon. Oh, that would be great. And we should go to it. That's fantastic. I would love that. Oh, that would be great. And I can get... Universal and others. I can get everybody to send the prints. That's the easy part. Oh, that's fantastic. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. Let's do it. All right. All right. We're, we have to go now because we're going to go organize this uh, movie marathon. But uh, I guess that's it for today. But again, I'll remind you, there are no shortcuts in this crazy show business, but there are many, many detours. This is Bill Getty with Tom Mount advising you to take that.